I made myself the poor excuse, first I will marry off my fatherless children, and then I will betake me to the Holy Land. Glickle does not flatter her children or overinflate their talents. One son, Labe, causes her particular anguish with his unsuccessful and irresponsible business deals and ac accumulation of de debts. As fast as he stopped up one hole, he opened another, thinking all the while, as such folk do, that he was mending matters. Glickle shared with Protestants of her time the sentiment that overmuch sorrowing, even for the death of a small child, is sinful. In Glickle's circle, marriage was clearly a business proposition. But as she tells the story, she grew to love her husband deeply, to admire him, and to be his partner in important decisions. The financial contributions from both sets of parents were carefully negotiated and as fraught with tension and uncertainty as any other new partnership. Thus, Glickle's son Nathan would have married the daughter of the wealthy Samuel Oppenheimer, but Oppenheimer's dowry was slow in coming due to bad weather, and Nathan's parents thought Opp Oppenheimer had backed out of the deal. Betrothals were arranged at an early age. Glickle's el eldest daughter, Zipporah, was betrothed shortly before her 12th birthday, just like Glickle's own was. Zipporah's wedding to the son of a wealthy Jew living in the Dutch city of Cleves was celebrated about a year and a half after her betrothal. The wedding sounds like it was a grand affair. It was attended not only by a number of prominent Sephardim, but also by various non-Jewish princes and other titled personages and great lords and enlivened by masked performers who bowed prettily and played all manner of entertaining pranks. In this brief sketch of Glickel's memoirs, I've stressed her difference from supposedly modern bourgeois Western norms of female domesticity and romantic love, but I've also expressed doubt whether her difference is attributable only to her being a Jewish woman. My brother, the Berkeley Talmud professor Daniel Boyarin, has taken up a similar question with regard to the masculinity of Jewish fathers. Right at the beginning of his book, Unheroic Conduct, he's careful to deny that he's suggesting an unchanging or essential pattern of Jewish gender relations. But he does argue that the structure of Jewish gender differs from that of the dominant European pattern. Thus, for example, in Greco-Roman notions of reproduction, the masculine was associated with form and spirit, the feminine with matter and body. By contrast, for Rabbinic Judaism, the father and mother together provide the matter, the white and the pupil of the eye, and only God provides spirit, that is, the capacity of the eye to see. Moreover, Daniel argues, male dominance in Jewish culture continued to coexist with a very different formation of male-female difference than that of the surrounding society. In fact, he turns to Glickel's description of her own beloved and deceased husband. As Daniel writes, in her description of her young husband as the ideal male Jew of her time, she emphasizes his inwardness, piety, and especially his meekness. She describes him as devoted, reliable, gentle, and emotionally warm. These, Daniel concludes, were not the characteristics of a knight in shining armor. Indeed, many of these traits would be more likely to fit the damsel in distress or an anchorite friar than a husband and man of the world. So, Glickel's husband, a damsel in distress? Daniel does mean to make the point dramatically. In fact, he names this distinctive Jewish pattern with the flamboyant and provocative term feminization. That's with two M's, fem. It was a pattern that came under increasing attack as abnormal or neurotic under the pressures on modern European Jews to conform to national and bourgeois standards. And here I have to insert another extemporaneous footnote. Um, you saw in the um, oh, it's no it's not it's it's not in the permanent exhibit it's in the special exhibit the uh, poster uh, to combat um, white slavery 
uh, promoted by the society that was led by Bertha Pappenheim, who was a descendant of Glickel of Hameln uh, and who has a famous self-portrait dressed in uh, clothes appropriate uh, to Glickel's time. What then of the Jewish family in the present and the foreseeable future? In the introduction to my book on Jewish families, I suggest that the most dynamic movement in contemporary Jewish life might be at its most traditionalist and its seemingly most experimental edges. But might the middle actually turn out to be the site where creative and resistant energies from new Jews and traditionalists come together? This kind of contingency entails a degree of uncertainty about who's really Jewish. But explicit awareness that the boundaries of Jewish kinship may not be as certain or as fixed as some would like to suppose goes back a long way to the sages of the Talmud and certainly beyond them. You see, we, we have to keep shuttling back and forth in time and space. We can't help it. Just when you think you're finishing, you're starting over again. The following brief tale recounts one rabbinic master's paralysis when faced with the task of choosing a wife for his son when the generations of Israel could no longer, as it says, be reliably documented, along with his colleague's retort. It says, Ulla went to Pumpadita to Rav Yehuda's house. He saw that Rav Yitzchak, Rav Yehuda's son, was grown and not married. He asked him, why hasn't Master taken a wife for his son? Rav Yehuda answered him, How can I know from where I might take a wife for him? Ula replied, How can we know from where we came? Ula drives his point home by citing biblical verses about prior moments when the sexual boundaries of the nation were breached. From Lamentations, they ravished women in Zion, maidens in the town of Judah. As a result, he suggests, the search for a bride with faultless genealogy could only be fruitless. To Rav Yehuda's puzzled inquiry as to how he might then go about seeking a fit wife, Ula suggests looking for a silent, that is, a calm and peaceful family, as the best evidence of genealogical purity. It's important to stress that this story refers to the heightened concerns of the rabbis, a group of male Jews who were extraordinarily worried about the honor and purity of their own lineages. Yet in a larger sense, the story also expresses an ancient and continuing impulse to keep going somewhere, even if we're not sure of our origins. Some things we do know. A reader of the introduction to my book chided me for dramatically pointing to the twin poles of contemporary Haredi traditionalism on the one hand, and on the other, the utterly free-form ethos of voluntaristic Jewish family making. She insisted that there's also a realm of contemporary Jewish family life marked by a more resilient mix of genealogy and flexibility, clear boundaries combined with open curiosity, and a passion for things of the world at large. I saw that on a, re on a visit to Cleveland, Ohio, where I stayed at the home of cousins of my wife, Alyssa Sampson. I'll call them Gabriel and D Dina. They lived in the Cleveland suburb, suburb called University Heights, in a neighborhood full of large synagogues, day schools, and other Jewish community institutions. Gabriel and D Dina were both teaching in the modern Orthodox neighborhood school associated with the religious Zionist Mizrahi movement, and their five children attended that same school. The walls of their living and dining rooms were lined with ranks of learned texts in Hebrew and Aramaic that elaborate on the meanings of scripture and the exigencies of Jewish practice. The basement, where I spent the night, was full of rather different books. Science fiction and fantasy, Jewish and world history, and a collection of stories all having something to do with Bruce Springsteen, who was not Jewish, unfortunately. At dinner, Gabriel spoke enthusiastically about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, lamented that the Cleveland Museum of Art is mostly closed for long-term renovations, and spoke of his family's planned move to Israel. They had not decided whether to settle in a religious community on the West Bank, 
where there was already family on both sides, or in a more religiously and socially diverse town inside Israel's pre-1967 borders. One key to what makes that Jewish family work is provided by another cousin's reminiscence of the creative spirit that Gabriel and Dina bring to family rituals. As this cousin reminded me, Gabriel and Dina always supplement our intellectual arguments at the Passover Seder table with more interesting events. During one Seder, Gabriel left the room and re-entered wearing a real policeman's uniform. Where are the sons of the Jews? He then led us up to the second floor and we found his youngest son in swimming trunks afloat in a plastic baby tub bath inside the bathtub. The next youngest, a girl dressed as a princess, discovered and saved him from the tub. This spirit of inventive iteration certainly seems to make it possible to identify the members of one's Jewish family with the ancestral figures of the Jews and to emphasize, empathize with the latter as real human beings, to create a sense of family that is at once grounded and open. It's accordingly tempted to point to this family whether in the diaspora or in Israel, as evidence that Jewish families, in something like the traditional sense, certainly can be sustained without a rigid rejection of the outside world. But other than to wish them well and to hope fervently to be in closer touch than I've been until now, it's not for me to predict this particular family's future. Other scholars are less reluctant. Jewish families, after all, are expected to be the vehicle that produces the next generation. The authors of a study of American Jews titled The Next Generation warned starkly that Jewish continuity is at risk in the contemporary United States. Noting that the family is normally expected to be the primary site of socialization into a subculture such as that of the Jews, they pointed to the weakened capacity of today's families to do so and the corresponding need for communal institutions to help fill in the gap. If I were really forced to make guesses about the future, I would point to growing numbers of traditionalist Orthodox Jews. I would posit the likelihood that their children and grandchildren will constitute a correspondingly growing percentage of those humans all over the world who are unambiguously regarded as Jews by themselves and by others. I would insist, however, that there are many waves of the future and that new forms of Jewish identity, including family patterns, are being invented all around us, whether scholars take note of them or not. And without venturing any speculations about the increasing or decreasing ranks of those in more liberal de denominations or secular Jews or new Jews of any description, I would say that the bounds dividing these latter from the vast majority of their fellow humans, who simply aren't Jewish, will continue to grow less and less clear. In any case, those who are concerned for upholding traditional notions of Jewishness should take note that it is traditionally considered bad luck to count Jews. Such discourses as those I've just been discussing generally presume a close link between communal crisis and a crisis in the family, and the family crisis is primarily understood to be one of outmarriage. Sylvia Barak Fishman notes the dilemmas of these discourses by frankly asking, is advocating for Jewish families racism? To be sure, her own answer will be that it is not. But she argues convincingly that American liberalism has a hard time separating out, out preference for in marriage from racism. To underscore the long standing pressure on Jews to accept out marriage, she quotes a respected American's warning to Jews in the 1890s that they must violate one of the fundamental regulations of their race, and that's the word that's used in 1890s, and take wives from the daughters of the land. A collection of essays titled The Jewish Family and Jewish Continuity, published in 1994, sounds like it's right on point for this evening's discussion. Still, both the reports and the research they draw on may seem a bit dated by now. Here's one way the Jewish family really does seem to be different today. As far as we can tell, 
It's changing faster than it ever has before. Two decades, therefore, is an epoch in the sociology and demography of contemporary American families, whereas scholars are quite comfortable talking broadly about Jewish families in antiquity or early modernity, themselves periods of centuries. Since there are real changes over the course of a decade or so, not only are projections uncertain, but the data they are based on are always already out of date. Still, the titles of the last three contributions in the 1994 volume say much. Intermarriage and Communal Policy, Prevention, Conversion, and Outreach. Policy Considerations for American Jewish Life, and Policies and Programs to Reaffirm the Centrality of the Jewish Family for the Jewish Community. The urgency of the study is marked by what fans of the Passover Haggadah might think of as six plagues. The editors note that in the late 1960s and 1970s, the traditions of the Jewish family were challenged by societal changes, which included the dramatic and sudden increase in the proportions of mothers working, divorce and the resultant single parent household, delayed marriage, a sharply reduced birth rate, an increase in mixed marriage, and increased mobility, resulting in the loss of support of the extended family. As 